Wish me luck. It's, it seems like a fairly long chapter. Uh, so hopefully this will go okay. Um, so uh, nothing remarkable about the learning objectives, uh, at least for me, the learning objectives are really to understand what conditions are in, in R, because condition seems like one of those very Lar very broad terms that could mean any number of things. Uh, and so I you know, really wanted to understand what they are in R and then how to use them. Um, and luckily that's exactly what the chapter does. Um, so what are, what then are conditions? Um, maybe kind of a short, a short kind of a definition, uh, maybe a, a mental model we can have for now is, is, is that um, you know, conditions arise when, when problems happen in your code. And those uh, where things happen, you know, let's say problems arise in, in, in your code, maybe I should say air quotes problems. Uh, so problems could be give rise to errors, could give rise to warnings or give rise to messages. These actually are the conditions, the, the default conditions in R. Um, and as a function author, um, you can signal those conditions. Um, for example, if anyone's written any uh, functions or even packages, probably you, you've used stop. Uh, you know, when something goes wrong in your in your function and your function can't continue because uh, something you know something has happened and your function can't recover, you can stop execution of the function and issue an error message. Um, you can issue other conditions as well, and we'll see that in a little bit. Um, so, wearing another hat as a function consumer, um, you know. Uh, whether you know as a pure kind of end user or as you know maybe a, a a developer that's a consumer of other people's functions, you know you need to be able to react to uh, uh, react to uh, conditions, right? So if there's an error message, let's say in a function that you're utilizing, you would want your function maybe to behave in a certain way, right? Either to provide a different error message or or maybe uh, take a different direction. So that's what conditions are, and broadly, kind of what we might want to do with conditions at a very, very high level. We'll try to flesh out the mental model uh, as we go. So first part of conditions is is uh, is is signaling conditions. So basically, we're going to talk about throughout the chapter about signaling conditions. Um, so letting R know that something has happened, uh, ignoring conditions in some cases. So uh, pretending that they they don't. These conditions don't exist, or at least not letting them impact our, our code. And then most importantly, handling the conditions. So let's start first with, with, with the errors, right? Because errors typically are, are a condition and you know, uh, where a problem arises such that your function cannot continue, right? Or a function cannot continue. So how how do you how do you throw an error message? How do you signal an error? There are a few, there are a few ways within, within R that you can do that. With base R, you can use uh, stop. Um, so, so I, I guess I've used uh, was it the uh, Supreme's uh, uh, song lyrics here, uh, stop in the name of love. Um, so here, um, you know, you, you can you can stop and issue an error message, and this is what it's going to look like by, by default. Uh, it's going to give some contextual information uh, and then and then your error message. Right. That's that's with base, base R with no with no other parameters. Uh, you can do the same thing in Rlang, but what's interesting about Rlang is that by default, Rlang's abort, which is kind of the Rlang equivalent of stop, uh, it, it takes out some of this contextual information by, by default. Um, so here, you know, abort, uh, you know, you notice that there's an error, and then you have the error message followed by an exclamation point. Notice I didn't put in the exclamation point in the text. It's prepended by by uh, by Rlang so that the end user can, can kind of know that this is a... Uh, this is an error state. Um, also, with base R, you can do exactly what what um, Rlang does for this basic example, and you can you can just add one um, one parameter, so it's call dot uh, equals false. So you can exclude the call component of uh, of the error message. So when you issue this this error, when you signal that there's an error, you can just have you know error prepended and then uh, then your error message. Um, right. A little bit of an aside here. Uh, we talked about error messages, um, and uh, you want to—you know—what are the mechanics of composing an error message? Um, with 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 stop. One nice thing about stop, which is a base R function, is that it it automatically pastes together all of the components uh, of your error message. Sorry, let me make this a little bit uh, larger. There we are. 
Uh, so, it, 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 you know, let's say you have an RMS that says your value is, and then we pipe in the value, some, some value from the outside. I'm going to just for this example, suppress the, uh, the, the call information. And you can see your call is one, right? So it's as if I called paste zero inside of stop. Um, actually, I, I learned with many of my packages, I was doing exactly that, not knowing that, that stop had this little inbuilt convenience. Now, if you wanted to use abort, uh, you know, the good news, as you saw earlier, is abort in Arlang has some convenience, uh, uh, you know, in that it removes this call by default, which is probably something that we, we might want. But the downside is that when you're composing more, um, more um, complex error messages, you have to rely on other tools. So in particular, glue for, for, for uh, composing those error messages. The good news is glue is really quite nice. And I think I would probably actually favor it over this paste paste zero or paste uh, type setup here. So here you just, you know, you create your string with glue, uh, your value is, and then you kind of um, uh, through string, string interpolation, bring in, bring in the sum value, which is outside and will and behold, you get your error message. There's a little link here too, uh, to the tidyverse style guide. So this, the, there's a tidyverse style guide, which is broad, but one component of it is actually a chapter about how best, pack, best practices around error messages. So I'll, I'll leave it to you if you're interested to kind of follow that that link. Let's move on now to the another uh, uh, another condition that we can signal a warning, right? Um, so one thing that's different about warnings uh, is, is that well, so first let me start. How do you do with a, how do you signal a warning? So with the warning function, so warning, and then you have some string inside. What's interesting about uh, warnings as as compared to errors is that you can within your functions signal multiple error messages. Uh, and the way that R works by default um, is that it'll kind of accumulate all of those uh, all of those warnings and then post those warnings at the end at the end of execution. Um, so here, um, actually, have these examples a lot a lot better, uh, where he actually has uh, he's printing to the console kind of uh, you know number one, number two, number three. Uh, probably you could do the same with you know system time just to see you know how it um, uh, prints to the console. But by default. Uh, warning messages are kind of issued in bulk uh, at the at the end of execution of a function, um, and like like the stop function, warning also has a call argument call dot. So it's the same same argument. Uh, so you can um, you can include uh, you can include uh, the call um, within the warning or or not. Um, and uh, just as just as stop has an Arling uh, analog uh, abort. So too does warning have, have an Arling um, analog, which is called warn. Um, and uh, you'll notice that the, the, call, the call information is suppressed by default in, in um, Arling's warn. Um, maybe a little bit of an aside here that comes up in, in, in this chapter. Hadley provides some advice to us as, as people who might include warnings in our functions. He, he's, he, in his view, warnings occupy this, this kind of odd middle ground between errors and um, errors and, and, uh, and messages. Um, so, you know, warnings are things that when, when they're signaled within the function, uh, execution of the function's code will not stop. So uh, then if you're, if you're making something to a warning, your function can handle, uh, can handle uh, what's going on, uh, you know, what may have happened that has triggered you as a kind of the the, the function developer to, to, to issue a, issue a warning, um, and but you know clearly it's information to the end user. So Hadley's advice is you know really he would he would say you know in, wherever you're tempted to put a warning consider instead consider instead putting putting a, a, an error message um, in, in, instead of a warning. Um, but he does see a few cases in which warnings are warranted, where, where they make sense. Uh, so one is uh, probably as, as, as uh, our users like me, you've seen this in the tidyverse functions is sometimes when um, a function changes, um, uh, uh, sorry, a package uh, gets updated, maybe functions or arguments of a function might get deprecated. Um, and so it might be useful as a package author to signal that to, uh, to, to people so that they're not relying exclusively on the docu on the function documentation, package documentation to know that something's being de deprecated. Instead, warn, warn, um, warn during use, um, so that this this function or or, or uh, argument is, is reaching end of the life cycle. Um, 
or or you know one where where you know, maybe where you are almost confident that your function can re can recover um, uh, because something has happened, right? If if you're not sure that it can recover, better to issue an error message and, and, and stop and stop execution. That's a little bit of an aside on, on, on warnings. Now to the third to the third um, the third condition within within R uh, and how to signal it is is with messages. So um, here uh, you know the mechanics are basically the same as above. You you just have you know message the message function. Um, uh, there's no call argument here. Um, and in terms of so that's on the mechanics. In terms of style, uh, oh actually I should say. Um, I don't remember where the book says this, but uh, in in base R, there's the there's the warning, actually the message function to issue um, um, basically the signal the the message condition, um, and issue and issue a message um, issue a message. Um, in R lang, I believe the analog is inform, so there's another function with an R lang to, that does the same same thing as uh, as base base R's uh, warning. Um, now, in terms of style, when when might you want to uh, might you want to consider a message? Um, uh, maybe when 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 users are using kind of default arguments and might involve some computational cost, or you want end users to be aware of certain um, default default arguments. Think ggplot with um, histograms, for example. Ggplot will will assume certain bin sizes. Um, now the end user should well be informed of that so that they understand that the graphic that's being generated is based on the assumption of certain bin sizes. And if the user wants a different kind of output, they should they should elect to have different bin sizes. That's one example of a case in which um, you know messages probably make sense to inform the user about some defaults that that um, yeah, about which they should be aware. This would go above and beyond, of course, the, the function documentation. Um, also, uh, I do, I've done this definitely in some of my packages that are uh, wrappers of, of, of APIs, is, is to really provide some status updates on what the function is doing um, in the background. So for functions whose basic, whose main aim is to have side effects. So for example, um, if you're interacting with an API, you know, API request has been sent, it's been, it's been received, uh, uh, you know, um, well, you, you could give some process information to the end user about what's going on behind the scenes, what the function is doing for you on your behalf, and what it, what the state at which the function find itself, finds itself interacting with some external service, like an API endpoint, or downloading a file. You know, let's say download, the file's been downloaded, you know, X number of percent, Y number of percent, Z number of percent, right? So this would be a good use case for messages. Um, in similar kind of a similar vein for long running processes, um, uh, you know, if you don't have access to a progress bar, um, or if you don't want to build a progress bar that shows on the console, perhaps you could issue messages at regular intervals to, 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 to say what the state is, um, you know, what the state of the process is. So kind of like I was saying for downloading a file, you know, 5% downloaded, 10% downloaded, etc. Um, and then also another common use case um, that you've undoubtedly seen, like I, um, is is uh, these 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 messages that happen upon attaching attaching um, packages to to a current R session. Um, so first to inform that the library is being is being loaded, and secondly, and maybe most importantly, that is that that package might be masking um, uh, functions, same named functions uh, um, uh, in 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 your session. So for example. You know, as, as an example, load deploy, you know, do library deployer, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, on now to, so we talked about signaling conditions, um, how, how use a, a, an end user can signal conditions, how can you ignore conditions? There, there are basically three ways in which you can do it, or maybe let's say two, because uh, these end up being very similar. First is with, with, with the, the function try. So what does try do? Um, so try basically displays an error when something when something happens, but continues execution of the code. So basically, uh, an error condition arises, but nevertheless, with try or we'll say a condition arises, and and, and, um, and then um, but execution can, of the code continues. So so let's see an example that kind of uh, put some put some flesh on, on on that. Is you know let's let's have a bad logarithm function 
where we, 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 we take the log of X and we wrap it and try. So we're gonna try to take the log of X regardless. And then, um, and then whatever the answer, we're going to actually return to the console, the number 10. Right, so if I if I if I uh, use the function bad log and I I, I uh, you know set x as bad, so clearly x is not a numeric value upon which you can take a log. So you you see an error message, and this is the error message that comes from the log function, right? When when it's fat past an invalid parameter, um, but notice the the function continues its execution onto the next line, which is simply to return the value ten. Right, so this is an example of where you could use you could use try. Um, uh, and well, or rather, what an example of what try does. Um, but probably in most cases, it, it might be better instead of just um, you know issuing an error message but continuing continuing uh, execution. It might be better to try to somehow react to or recover from conditions. Uh, so you know, two bits of advice here. Um, you know, how, how might you do that? One is to use try catch. We're going to come to that later, which basically tries to, it, it, it tries the code and then it catches any condition that's signaled by the code. So let's say an error arises, it, it capture, it kind of catches the error state and then allows you as a, as a developer to basically say, okay, now that we have an error, now that we have a certain condition, how should the function react, right? So if you have an error condition, think of it as like a, a switch in the logic, um, you know, if this, then that, uh, et cetera. But instead of the, you know, the kind of the, the, the thing upon which the, the switch acting being a value, instead it's a condition that's, emit, that's signaled by, by R code. So basically you try to kind of, you catch the area and then try to perform maybe a different action conditionally on the the condition that's signaled um, from from uh, from the code, or an alternate might be <clears throat> another alternate might be to set kind of a a default value. So here here's an example where you know we set a def default to null, uh, and then what we try to do is we try to read this file um, um, uh, silently um, and and then. You, know, you can't open the file because the file doesn't exist. Um, but notice, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't error exactly, right? Okay, so we've we've seen there are a couple ways to ignore conditions. Uh, so one is with try, we ignore a condition and then continue, right? Another other ways to ignore conditions is to basically suppress them, like kind of suppress basically their side effects. So. There, there are two, and their names kind of indicate exactly their scope. So suppress warnings, suppresses warnings, suppress messages, suppresses messages, right? So how does that work in practice? Um, <clears throat> earlier, remember we had this warn function from, uh, from earlier that just basically issued a bunch of warnings uh, one after the other. Um, so if I, uh, let me actually toggle back to that function. There we go. So you'll notice that we have this warn function. This is your first warning. This is your second warning. This is your last warning. The function does nothing more than issues three warnings, right? So let's let's use let's use that function. If we wrap it in suppress warning, we see nothing coming afterwards. We don't see the warnings, right? Now, you'll have to trust that here in this code block, I've actually executed the function, um, but you'll notice that error messages don't appear simply because I wrapped this in. In, in uh, uh, wrapped this invocation of the warning function in suppress warnings. Likewise, you could suppress messages. So, you know, I could have some function called many messages and the uh, simple idea, you know, the idea is very much the same. The function simply issues message one, two, three, and then by wrapping suppress message, or say by wrapping many messages, this function in suppress message, I suppress all the messages that are issued here. So basically we ignore the condition that, that arises, right? Every time we issue message, there's a condition, message condition, message condition, message condition. So we're, 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 we're suppressing the condition and we're suppressing its side effects of, you know, printing the, the something to the console. So we talked about signaling, we've talked about ignoring. Now let's talk about maybe the most interesting part and the part that we're gonna concentrate on, the re on for the rest of the chapter and that's handling conditions. Oops, I messed up with my emo uh, emoji here. Um, so basically there, there, are three, there are three default conditions. Uh, uh, so, so there are three default conditions and those, each one of those conditions has a default behavior. Errors, 
halt execution. Um, uh, warnings, uh, as you mentioned earlier, are collected during execution, displayed in bulk at the end of execution of a function. I'm supposed to have a different emoji here. Sorry about that. Um, and messages are displayed immediately, right? So condition is error, condition is warning, condition is message, and each one of those conditions has a, a default behavior. Um, so what condition handlers allow you to do is it basically allows you to have a different behavior, potentially different behavior as a function of the condition. So if the condition arises, then we can have, we can do something else, right? So there, there are two different, different condition handlers. There are different types and we'll look at them extensively. One is called try catch. One is called uh, uh, with call, uh, calling handlers. But the idea here is, you know, this is sort of some pseudo code. It says like, let's have try catch. The way, the way you should read it is, Basically, what you would want to do is first try to run some block of code that would be here, be here, right? So this is kind of non-syntactic. It's not a value that exists, but just imagine there's a block of code here. Um, and then if if there's a if a condition is signaled um, by by this block in this block of code, then we'll move to this block right here. Uh, and what happens is you'll have these, these handlers that will have a single argument, which is CND, which is kind of by convention, the condition itself, right? The condition itself. Um, and then as a function of the condition, so if there's an error message, then we run some code when the error is thrown. So that's the kind of way in which to think about, you know, this, this try catches, you know, we'll try to run this code listen for an, a condition being signaled. If, an, if a condition is being signaled, then we'll, 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 we'll move to the condition handlers that'll do something. Um, uh, um, you know, like in our case, if there's an error, it'll do something in the event of an error. You could do the same, um, you could do the same here. This happens to be, uh, but the idea is kind of the same. So here we used an error. We could also have warnings. Um, so again, the idea is you know try to run some code. This would be a block of code, um, and listen for a condition being signaled by the code. If there's a warning, do this. If there's a message, do this. Right. Um, that's kind of the overall basic basic model. Now we're talking about conditions, and we haven't really explained what a condition is. It turns out, like everything in R, it's an object. It's a it's a special object, a condition object. Um, so, uh, how can you catch a condition object? Um, uh, luckily for us, there is there's an Arlang function for that. So, uh, Arlang catch cnd uh, condition. So, here's what how we might do it. Let's just throw an error, an arbitrary error. Um, we'll catch it in the condition object, and then let's inspect it. And when we inspect it, we notice that the that this this particular let's call it base condition object. So, by default, the condition objects consist of two elements. Um, they, can dis they consist of a message. So this is a message that we provide. Uh, and, and, and it can uh, consist of a call. Um, and then that call has some, some attributes. But it's a simple error. It's an error in its condition. Um, and, and you know, you, you can, for these things, for example, you, you can, if, if you want to later, uh, you, can, you can actually extract these elements too, right? So, um, if you um, if you want the error message, you can use a condition message, um, uh, and then it'll extract the message component of the condition object. Or if you want the call, you can use condition call and extract the condition component of of the uh, of the condition object. Um, now, I, I said earlier this is kind of like a def, uh, like a base uh, a base uh, condition object. Um, the chapter doesn't touch too much on this, but uh, uh, suffice it to say that, you know, just like, you know, when we had kind of base class, base uh, uh, data types in R, there are also these other data types like, you know, S3. Um, so you can easily expand this condition object and have custom conditions where the conditions can contain other things as well than this, but every condition will contain these things. Um, some conditions may contain other, other things that are useful, perhaps for the developer and reacting to them, or maybe for error messages, uh, et cetera. Uh, chapter doesn't go into too much detail on this, but uh, it, it looks like a very interesting uh, thing to research in future. So I mentioned earlier, we have these two, these two, these two handler functions, try catch and with calling handlers. So it turns out that there are actually two types of handlers. So they're handlers 
um, uh, there are uh, what, what the chapter calls exit handlers and calling handlers. Um, so we'll look at each one of them in turn. Um, first, we'll talk about exit handlers. So exit handlers are so named because uh, basically whenever a condition arises, the handler um, exits the normal flow of execution and turns control over to the, uh, the, the handler itself. Um, and, and, and control never returns back to the rest, the normal block of code within the function. So to explain that, let's look at, it, at an example. Let's imagine we have, uh, you know, we're back to our logarithm function. So we could, we could, we could have some function called F3, which has inside of it this try catch block. And it says, you know, let's try to run the log uh, function, right? Um, and if, there, if an error condition is signaled, then let's return NA, right? Um, so what happens here is, you know, let's say we're going to invoke F3 and pass it um, a character, right, X, which obviously the log can't return. So what happens then is we try to run the log function, an error is signaled. Upon the error being signaled, control within the function goes to this handler, and then the handler takes care of everything. And then from there, we don't return back to the log or any other block of uh, code. It's basically a way to, like, end execution, end execution, in a graceful way um, that you know maybe makes makes sense. So here, since you can't take the log of quote x, we return an NA value. We could have done other things as well, but this is just an idea of how 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 it works. Um, contrast, uh, um, yeah. Here's here's another um, here's another example of, of the same. Um, so let's let's imagine we have this little try catch block. And what's interesting is you'll see here that this code never gets run. And let's let's work through why. Um, so we have we have a we have try catch. So try catch is an exit handler. So whenever it 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 detects a condition um, for which it has a handler, the handler grabs control uh, and and takes care of the rest. So here um, uh, we have a try catch. We have a code block right here that's being run. We have we have a condition handler that uh, is looking for messages. Message the message condition. So if we look at this code, the first block here is we um, we see we try to evaluate this. We see that there's a message condition signal, and then automatically because it's a message condition um, and the signal, we go to the error. Or sorry, we go to the uh, the handler, the exit handler here, which says for every message, return there to the console. So what's interesting is you'll notice here here is not evaluated. It, it's only it only the only thing the only kind of way in which is evaluated from uh, from our perspective is a, it generates a side effect kind of of, of issue of signaling a condition um, that's a, that it's issuing a message uh, and then from there it goes and uh, you know evaluates it there so we never see here in the console and we never see this code is never run because there's no way in the way we've constructed it that execution will ever reach this block. It reaches this block, but notice that the, the message isn't isn't printed to the to the console, right? Only only this message is printed to the console there. Um, now, also try catch. Um, we haven't looked at this so far, but try catch uh, has another argument um, in the exit handler called finally, um, and basically this finally block um, is run regardless of the condition that the code we're trying to run issues. So, um, so let's imagine, you know, with this, this function, we're trying to write some text to disk, right? Um, and if, if an error message is signaled, um, for example, the path doesn't exist, or even if no condition is signaled, so basically in both cases, we're gonna execute the finally block. Uh, so let's kind of think through it here. Like, you know, let's, let's imagine this path did exist. We're going to try, Actually, there's there's some code being tried here, but it, 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 let's imagine there's some code being tried. Um, oh, sorry, no, there is code being tried here. Um, we'll write we'll write lines. There's no there's no exit handler in this particular case, but let's imagine there were an exit handler. If the path didn't exist, that would be an error message. We'd have an error uh, exit handler. We'd have a handler for the error condition. Do something. Still, we would go to this finally block and basically delete the file right here. Um, this block is always, always run. Or alternatively, let's imagine the path does exist. So then we try, we try to run this code. We'd write the lines, you know, high to, you know, the connection right here for, for the path. Um, and then still, 
the finally block would be run and would delete the, the file that's been that's been written. So finally is is, is basically it's it's there for sort of um, tear down, right? So if if your if your function has side effects, uh, you can make those you can kind of correct those side effects before the end of execution of the function by having this finally block and have have the, the, the this, this, this cleanup be done in either case, right? So either the condition, there's a condition issued or there's not a condition issued, right? Okay, um, I've talked a lot. Maybe I can stop and see if there are any questions or con confusion here and also sip a cup of coffee. <laughs> Arthur, this is great so far, and I appreciate your your commitment to to the uh, discussion. Um, I did have a quick question regarding handlers in general, and one of the first things that come to mind is log data. Now, doing a brief research while you're you're talking, uh, there is a log R package um, that would capture some of this media, but I don't, I don't, I, I guess my question. This is all like in an interactive mode, right? It's only going to be to the session that you're currently working in that you would witness some of these particular handlers, correct? The the messages printed to the console. Oh, that's that's a good question. Oh. No, I think you, there we go. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Sorry about that. Um, uh, that's a good question. I'm actually coming from the perspective of someone who is a Stata user and also a little bit SaaS, where you know you had these these messages, you know, kind of process messages were you know both shown in the console and with very little effort were kind of saved to an external file. Um, that's that's a that's a great that's a great question. Well, and so I, I, I mean, this is going to be an unsatisfying response, Ryan. But I, I mean, so I think. The, the, the conditions will be handled in so far as like in a non-interactive session, like a vanilla session of R um, would, would be, you would, you would be able to observe the side, you would be able to observe like the side effects of, of it. So if you know, your code didn't run and maybe you had some, you know, some, something happens if the code doesn't run properly, you'd be able to see that side effect. But as for logging it, um, I'm not sure if you find an answer for that. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really super interested. But actually, right. the, on, on the logging, it's uh, uh, the, there's actually a, ni a nice example. I didn't maintain it here, but in the uh, application section, there's a really nice example of. Uh, so this kind of comes to custom. Uh, is this it? Yeah, I was gonna say I may be, I may be future asking a question that that may be covered in a in a topic here coming up but the 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 one element i guess that i was digging while we were while you were talking there is an r history could, where, where you could in, in effect um you could in effect kind of have custom conditions um and then you could let those custom conditions have you know, if a custom condition is detected then you could write something to a log right um, and then you could obviously format the elements of the log in, in a way that suited your, your liking. But yeah, to, to the, the question about generic loggers in R, I'm only passingly familiar, which is to say I know the name of log R, but I don't know. And I've always wanted to know if there were something like that in R. Um, Agreed. Yeah. Well, the, the and, and just to clarify, so I did find there is a dot R history. It's a hidden file. Um, and I don't okay. know what this would look like in Windows. So just know I'm coming from a Unix type of format. But dot usually indicates that it's a hidden folder and you yep. have to expressly call it yep. open. But the uh, the R history, there is a uh, in, uh, if interactive suppress message and then dev tools, uh, require dev tools. That, I believe, is a, a base install. So like when you when you initially install R Studio, that dot r history is created with that argument already built in and so if we all know that if you use dev tools it kind of opens up a whole other window of opportunity uh with within the uh, r uh, interaction so the i haven't found a direct log unless you explicitly tell it to log data so i think what we're seeing here with the chapter is is really uh just that console type output uh, not so much from a from a, a logger 
type application. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Nice question, Ryan. Um, uh, definitely in kind of an area of I guess future research uh, for, for for me too. Um, so I guess maybe there there are no questions so far on the the exit handlers. Let's move to calling handlers. Um, so basically, the way to I think the best way to explain as yeah, actually the book does to, to explain to explain calling handlers is in kind of two ways verbally and then with code so verbally and in both cases by comparison so verbally you know with exit handlers you know we saw that whenever a condition arises um then then uh... i think arthur froze Okay, it is going to. Uh, um, <laughs> Maybe his network is not strong. Uh, uh, Ryan, you can put uh, um, this uh, this function like inside. Uh, your code, no? You, Correct. If you do an app, if you do a script, uh, and everything right. you can add. These functions, yep. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, my my internet's been kind of spotty. Uh, yeah, it's been spotty these these uh, this this morning. I anyway, now I'm on my Wi-Fi from my phone. Um, fingers firmly crossed um yeah there there was no exit handler right so uh, you didn't see an uh, an artful error message when uh, when my my wi-fi re reached an error condition um so uh yeah basically on to kind of calling handlers so kind of the way in which you think about calling handlers is is the is is the following so uh basically to think about them in contrast to exit handlers so I'll give a verbal explanation and then kind of a code explanation. So the verbal explanation is that you know with exit handlers they 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 do what they say that they're going to do. They they exit the normal flow of uh, of code execution once a condition is is handled, or at least a condition for which there's a handler. Um, in contrast, calling handlers continue the normal execution of code um, uh, and then return it back uh, once uh, after the handler has kind of done its job. So. To show that rather than say that, um, let's look at an example. Um, so here, um, you know, we have try catch, which is a uh, an exit handler, um, uh, and and so here we can see we've got a a, hand, a message handler. So uh, right when you know, we're going to execute this block of code, right when the message condition is is signaled, control goes to the message to this handler. Um, and then we just uh, print to the console, caught a message, and you can see indeed that's what's happened. This doesn't get executed, and this doesn't get executed. So basically, once a condition is detected, we exit the normal flow of code and then go to a handler. Um, with calling handlers, you'll see things work a little differently. Um, so with calling handler, um, we still have the code that we're going to run, and then we have some handlers as well. Um, so here you'll see, uh, you know, we first run this first line, someone there, message, uh, a message condition is uh, signaled. So we go to the handler and it says caught a message. Then after this has done its work, we return, we return to this message and print the message to the console. Then we move to the next line and a message condition is returned. Then we return again back to the handler uh, and print caught a message and then finally we execute this line you can see that's exactly what's happened in the console caught a message someone there caught a message why yes um so that's that's the difference between the two the um the 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 the, the calling handler kind of returns control to the original call um after after the handler has done its done its work whereas the exit handler exits uh, execution of the function What's kind of strange about exit or sorry calling handlers is uh, or interesting about them is that is that they 
kind of, let's see, conditions kind of can, in the jargon of the book, they bubble up. Or so like, uh, let's imagine that you have a nested, nested handler calls, right? Here you can see we have a with calling handlers and then inside of that we have a with calling handlers, right? Um, and if a condition is signaled, then it's signaled kind of in two levels. So to walk through this function, uh, we first try to execute this, right? Uh, and a message condition is signaled. So then we go to the first handler, um, which prints to the console level one. Then from there, we bubble up to the, the parent um, uh, here in the message handler, and then we print level two. And then after the handlers have finished their work, then we return here and print hello to the console. So you'll see that's what happened, ha has happened level one, level two, hello. So in, in a sense, like there's some, some contagiousness or it bubbles up, whatever metaphor you use, basically the condition that occurs in the most nested element, like the child, kind of um, reaches all of the parents as well, all of the parent handlers. Uh, this could be useful or this could be annoying. If this side, if this kind of default behavior is, uh, 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 and actually, so what, what is true here um, for the calling handlers is also true for the, the try catch, um, uh, I should say. Um, but the good news is if this, if this is annoying, you can, uh, in the jargon of the book, and I guess thus of our lang, you can muffle the signal um, at, at various levels. So we'll look at kind of two cases where the signal the signal is muffled so that handlers don't react. So here we've got yet again we we have the same nested the uh, kind of nested structure where you have you know one with calling handlers it's nested inside another with calling calling handlers and each one of them has a message handler right. So the way this would work is we would try to do hello uh, we we try to message uh, hello message condition is issued so then we go to the first handler the first handler prints level one uh, to the, uh, yeah, prints level one to the, um, uh, to the console. Then, um, then we go to the second handler uh, and do level, level one. Um, oops, I think I've made a mistake here. Um, uh, we've, we've, uh, we've, um, yeah, we'll print level two to the console. And then here, I, I forgot to namespace this with Arlang, but what it does is it, it muffles the condition. So here we still have a message condition. Uh, and then what happens here, this is kind of a weird thing I thought for the book to explain first, but what happens is um, we'll muffle the condition. So actually it doesn't return here um, uh, to the default condition of, of, of actually issuing the, 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 the message. Let's look at this one as well. I can walk you through it, but unfortunately, I've encountered the same error because I failed to um, because I failed to uh, uh, provide a Arlang namespace. Um, but I'll walk you through it. So again, we have a nested a nested uh, uh, setup. One with calling handlers that's wrapped inside another. So we'll attempt. We'll try to issue a message. A message condition is uh, signaled. The handler takes over, prints to the console level one, then we muffle the condition um, and uh, it goes back and prints hello to the, to the console. So we don't rise to this message handler because basically we say there's no more message condition and so it doesn't bubble up to the parent uh, here. Right. Um, I think I'll, in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll skip this section. Uh, this is a fairly short section that just talks about the difference in the call stack depending on the the, the message handler that, or sorry, the um, uh, the call handler that you use. Um, I'll move on to custom conditions. So let's get some motivation for why you might want to have custom conditions. Um, so. Uh, or at least custom error messages. Uh, so if you look at base, uh, the log function in the base in the base package, it really doesn't do very much. So if you, you have two, you have two parameters, x and then base. 
And if you know you try, try to provide a vector of letters uh, um, to log, but you can't evaluate, it just as error, non -ar a non numeric argument to mathematical function. And then if you have an uh, if you pass a, a wrong parameter to, to to base, you get exactly the same error message. So it's not very helpful. It doesn't tell you where the problem lies, right? So here, you know, Hadley in the book says we can we can do better. Um, so let's write this function called my log. Um, which 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 does which does the following. So what it does is it it, it has um, it evaluates each condition. Um, so sorry, it checks each um, each parameter, and then it, it, we have an error condition um, that's signaled based on what we what we find there. So for example, here, um, you know, if 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 uh, the vector of numbers is uh, uh, is non-numeric, then we'll issue an error message saying that it's that 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 argument uh, contains a uh, must be a numeric vector and not the type whatever the type is of x. Uh, and then likewise, we'll evaluate um, we'll evaluate whether um, this base uh, the, the base of a logarithm function is uh, is is also uh, if it's non-numeric, we'll do the same. We'll do the same thing, and but we'll say, you know, look, base. The base parameter is non-numeric, and uh, it needs to be numeric, but not this. So let's look at the difference between the two. Um, so, um, or sorry, let's look at how this works rather. So, if we if we do as we did before, and we we provide, you know, this uh, the uh, argument x is a, a vector of uh, uh, letters, then you'll see error of um, Says error in abort, could not find. Ah, okay, never mind. All right, I definitely have to namespace these things. But you, you we, we basically said what it would what it would do, right? And and, and as we we're talking through the function uh, it, itself, when I'm before I before I push my PR to the repo, I will namespace these things. But basically, you know, the error message will will now be informative and tell us which argument has the problem and what the, the type is of the thing that we pass to that particular argument. So uh, that end users will understand the nature of the problem and can hopefully fix that problem. Right. Um, so we've talked, all right, that's the, kind of the broad motivation. Um, so you can kind of create help. Well, in, in doing this, you you know, uh, Hadley said basically you see a lot of this common pattern um, that we just saw. And, and what we could do is we could even create this this kind of helper function. Uh, let's say abort when there's a bad when there's a bad argument, right? We can construct the message. Arguments must be something, uh, and then we have a must parameter, um, and not of type, and then whatever the type is, and then uh, add that to the glue. The glue expression. So basically, this uh, and then pass this all to to abort, right? So that we have a nice a nice uh, error message. So we could rewrite my log in this way, which is a little bit more elegant because we've written this helper function. Um, you know, if if it's non-numeric, then uh, you know we'll in invoke this function bad uh, argument abort bad argument, and uh, x must be numeric and not and then whatever the, the type is of X, uh, and then likewise do the same thing for base. And then we'll have informative error messages as uh, we should hopefully see before. But again, I need to namespace the, the rlang functions. Um, right. So the, where, where you can kind of go with this is, uh, in addition, is you can you know, think, you can kind of think about handling, right? Um, so it, it, you know, since, you know, earlier we, we saw that we just have this base class of, of, of kind of condition objects, but we could add a class to our uh, our conditions, right? Create custom conditions and then handle those conditions in a custom way. Um, so you, you might imagine like in my, my log A um, that, uh, you know, if we have an error message, then it'll come here. But if we have this particular error bad argument, then we'll handle that particular type of, you know, class of error message through a different, a different handler. That could be the, the motivation there. So we could add to the condition object some class that says something about the nature of the problem, uh, and then have a dedicated handler for that class of, that class of condition. So it could be an error, but with a particular condition. Uh, now, Hadley notes in the book something very important um, is that uh, when when evaluating when try catch uh, or I guess all kind of handlers, but you know probably try catch try catch in this case evaluates which handler uh, it should go to. 
it kind of does like a lazy matching in the sense that it finds the first, uh, it's starting from the top, from the very beginning, it tries to find the first handler that would be an appropriate handler for the signaled condition. So if you have very specific conditions, so in this case, you have an error, but of a very particular type, put those first so that they are kind of uh, evaluated, evaluated first, right? That's just a little tip. All right, good. Um, applications here, I'm going to go to the book because um, the book had some really interesting stuff that I didn't feel like I should bother replicating. Um, but uh, yeah, here we go. So there, there's some, you know, what, what can you do with conditions? Uh, use try catch conditions. Here, here he, just showed, he just kind of showcases a few common patterns um, that he's, he's seen. One is you could have like a failure, a failure value, right? Uh, this is, you know, generic, it's kind of like what we saw with the log function. Like if the log function fails, maybe we should, we should still provide something back to the end user that's not an, an error. Maybe we should have some default, some failure value. Um, and so kind of generically, it would be like, you know, have some like fail with function. Um, you know, if, if uh, you know, we'll evaluate this expression, if the, if the evaluation of the expression signal the condition, then we'll go to the handlers. Let's imagine it's an error. And in the event there's an error, we'll, we'll return some value. <clears throat> so in that way we can, we can, we can, um, you know, uh, return some value. So like, let's imagine we just wrap the log function, uh, wrap the log function with this fail with right here. So if we do that with a value, a valid uh, a thing, and you say, you know, if, if it fails, um, you know, the failure value will be uh, 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 an NA, um, uh, you know, we can evaluate, we can do regular logs, but if we have something that doesn't make sense for a log, that will be returned in NA instead, right? We're not going to have an error that'll come as a result of the function, but instead an in NA, right? So failure values, that's one thing. Another, which is kind of an extension of this, is let's imagine you have failure and success values, right? That are, that are issued by the, the, the function. So it would be kind of generically something, something like this. Um, you have some function, um, you're going to evaluate an expression of the function. If, if, if it succeeds, then by natural, you know, kind of by the flow of, of evaluation, it's going to come and it's going to return the success value. But let's imagine that this, this expression, this uh, expression yields an error. Now we don't want to return the error to the end user. Instead, we want to return, um, you know, some value. So here, if, if this expression signals an error condition, it goes to the error handler, uh, and then we can, we can have some error value. So it might be, you know, we could just say, is there an error when we try something, right? Maybe, uh, so if we try this, if there's not an error, then we'll return false. There's no error, right? If, uh, if in evaluating whether, um, uh, you know, something errors, so if it does error, so if it signals an error state, it's going to go to the error handler and it's going to return true. So that's, this is kind of a, a way in which we can, we can, we can basically uh, return both a success and a failure, a failure value, right? Um, for example, you're trying to do something with an API and you, you know, get returned to 500 code or something like that. Well, you could, you know, you could have a function, did it work? Um, and the did it work could re needs to return probably a true or false. Um, and you just need to have, uh, you know, some handler will say, if something bad happens, then return some, some, some failure value. If a good thing happens, return uh, a success value. Um, Another, another thing that, that could be done um, in another pattern that Hadley sees with, with uh, conditions is what he calls re-signaling. Um, so basically, you, know, you, you could basically convert a warning into an error, right? So that a warning issued by a function actually errors for, 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 for the function you make. So let's imagine some function called warning to error. Um, you know, what it'll do is you know, have some expression. Um, and if the expression issues a warning, um, or if the function issues a warning, then we'll go to the warning handler, um, which then um, which then takes you know strips out here the condition message. So the mess the the, the message uh, that's part of the condition object uh, that's signaled by this this function or expression, and then and then we abort. So which is basically the same Rlang uh, for for stop, which will be an error message. So we turn what is a warning into an into an error, right? Um, this is, okay, this is, I think the one, no, this still isn't the one. 
Uh, yeah, another thing that you can, another common pattern, um, and this is a bit, honestly, like uh, if you're familiar with PERS safely, um, you, what you can do is you can create some, uh, some function that simply captures conditions um, and records them uh, as, an, as an object or returns some kind of artifact of the condition. Um, so here, uh, imagine we have some list of conditions. So we're going to return a list at the end. Um, and, and then you know, we've, we've got some function to add conditions. So we'll add conditions to this condition list object uh, and then muffle the condition. And then with calling handlers, we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to evaluate this expression. If there's a warning, if there's a message, we add that message to the con the condition list. If there's a uh, sorry, if there's a message, we'll add it to the condition list. If there's a warning, we add it to the we add it to the uh, the war um, the condition list as as well. Um, taking note that it's a that's a that's a warning, uh, etc. Um, so at the end of the day, you could you could have something something like this. Um, sorry, I'm going kind of fast for, for time. Um, and also, I think an interesting thing is, uh, th this is, I, I guess, thinking about how you would go beyond, well, if, if, you have a, if you have a custom, if you have a custom condition, um, then, uh, then there may not be a default behavior for that custom condition, right? So the, the, the conditions that have a default behavior, are the standard ones in R. So uh, error message, uh, sorry, error, error warning message, right? Let's imagine you have some other condition. Well, you know, you need, you need, uh, you would need to have some way to handle that custom condition. And, and that would be through an event, event handler. Like let's say here, they, there's imagining we have a, law, a condition of class log, um, then we need to have some way to react to that log condition. So this is actually for, for, for Ryan, who I think dropped off uh, of how you could kind of log log things. Um, I, guess, I, guess, I guess I'll end there. Sorry, I talked both very long and very fast. Sorry about that. It felt like a very long chapter, um, but with a lot of material in it, um, I found it really quite interesting. I think I finally now understand uh, uh, conditions in R uh, to a certain degree. Before I was always, I would open, you know, do question mark try catch in my console, and then and then scratch my head raw trying to figure out what on earth it does. But this chapter, I think, successfully it gives me like a good frame for thinking about what the what they do, how they work, and how I can I can do with them that, how I can work with them. And I'm I'm really eager for, for, to go back to some of the packages that I made and introduce this because uh, it frankly solves some of the problems I hadn't found a good solution for. Anyway, I'll stop there. See if anyone has you know questions, reactions. Um, and then after in the next coming hours, I'll try to post this content as a PR to uh, um, to the repo first, adding namespaces to the things that uh, didn't work. Thank you. I I do not have uh, many questions. As, uh, yes, so I think I'm going to uh, try to catch them <laughs> and see uh, how I can apply them uh, maybe inside a um, shiny app that, that would be useful somehow. Oh, that's a really nice use case, Federica, because then uh, then you exactly. then then your then your shiny app doesn't like break if an error state arises. You can kind of do something. That's a that's a great point. You that you know the 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 best you explain a possible error, uh, the 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 better is for the user uh, if there's any. Um, accessing your code because sometimes you know things breaks and uh, uh, you can you don't know what to do because the the error releases from from some sort of action that you did it is not very um, pointing to the to the solution so even if you search on the internet you you might not be able to find the those kind of so an explanation to those kind of warnings. 
and and this uh, you you can find more information about this uh, on um, uh, the shiny uh, introduction book. Uh, the, the, there's a like a chapter talking about those things, and as well there said uh, you can uh, like achieve a higher level of uh, codes for the user when you specify about um, possible outcomes caused from, from using the, the code, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, Federica. I think that's a really nice use case. And also I, I have a little kind of a resources section I put in at the end. Um, Arlang has some really nice, uh, whoops. Um, well, so first thing is uh, during the RConf 2022, there was a, a master, uh, package development master class by Hadley and, and a few others. Uh, um, they, they kind of, uh, uh, a little bit to, to your point, they have a, a one element of that is, uh, unfortunately, none of us were, were there, or at least I wasn't there. I think Federico was in a, another one too. But they, they have some resources about how you can um, kind, of, kind of provide more helpful error messages to end users of your functions. And so, um, it turns out a lot of these are part of uh, Arlang. Uh, so if you go, whoops, I went to exactly the wrong one. Um, up, up, uh, yeah, Arlang. Uh, so they have a whole section, um, you know, along the top are on conditions about how to do a lot of these things. And I think interestingly too, the thing that I've been enviously looking at for a long time is formatting formatting error messages with CLI, this package CLI, where you can get um, you know, let's say nice, nice looking, nice ASCII, but nice looking um, error messages that maybe have, you know, exclamation point or a bullet. It's sort of like a little bit bringing pseudo CSS to, to, to the like ASCII console. Um, so this is something I've been wanting to do is just provide these nice um, error messages or information messages like you see if you've ever used use, use the use that or so use this package. Um, or, or other packages that, uh, and, and I think increasingly, like I think Deepwire and a lot of the tidyverse are incorporating this uh, as well. So anyway, for people that are curious about how they can, you know, have nicer looking and more useful error messages, I think these are great resources. I've not looked through them yet, but they look very, very promising. Okay, so we're done with chapter eight. So see you next week with chapter nine. So we reach the first, the, the, the end of the first uh, part of the book, which is quite an achievement. So yeah. Uh, so next next week will be functional factories. And uh, yeah. So all who will, will lead us. Yeah. Okay. That would be looking great. forward. Yeah, looking forward to next week. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, see you next week. Okay. Bye bye. Good night. Bye. Bye bye.